Und ich möchte zum nächsten, zum nächsten Vortrag übergehen. It's a great honor for me to have uh, Professor Tombal here. He has already been in uh, Geneva yesterday and so he knows quite a lot about Swiss urology and he will give us a talk about uh, metastasis, metastasis directed therapy for oligometastatic prostate cancer. Are we doing the right thing? And I think this question is following us all and every day. Are we really doing the right thing with our patients? So, thank you very much for the invitation. Actually, that talk is clearly following the previous one. And uh, so we're going to try to do uh, what basically we do with all these beautiful imaging. Does it really change the life of the patient? And that's, I believe, is a relevant question. Here are my conflict of uh, interest. I have a lot because I do a lot of clinical trials. And today I decided that I'm going to take more the hat of the uh, academic researcher than the everyday practitioner and try to do what uh, we should basically do every day is when we treat this patient as a physician, maybe remember what the uh, methodologist and the scientist would tell us. So. Um, the title you gave me was, do we do the right thing? So I say basically, what is that thing? So I try to have a definition of the thing in that context. And uh, I believe that what you asked me to speak about was that what we recommend now, which is using ablative treatment by surgery or stereotaxic radiotherapy in the context of metastatic disease, a setting which is historically considered for systemic treatment. I uh, remember I did some of my training uh, in uh, John Hopkins and uh, with Pat Walsh, you would never operate somebody with a PSA above 20. And uh, if the guy had a PSA above 50, you would give radio or hormone therapy. So I think we have moved very far away from this. And uh, we can decide on two forms of ablative treatment. It can be on the primary. So should we remove the prostate in metastatic cancer patient? That's not the question for today. The question for today is, uh, should we also treat metastatic deposit uh, and in a disease that is def defined arbitrarily by a number, location, or size of lesion? When does it apply? This is the natural history of advanced prostate cancer. There are two groups of patients, basically. You have the newly diagnosed metastatic cancer. We treat them with ADT, plus minus docetaxel, plus minus abirateron. This is the standard of care. They usually progress rapidly, become metastatic and CRPC, and die. Beside that, we have the <coughs> very broad group of high-risk localized disease that we treat with local treatment plus minus ADT, whether it's surgery, radiotherapy. We know that a, s a fair amount uh, will have a PSA progression. The standard treatment has been to give ADT for many years, early, late. Uh, and then they still progress usually. We can give another line of salvage treatment. And then at some point they are becoming castration resistant and die. Not all of them, roughly no more than 30%. And actually when we speak about MTT, we can apply this at basically three stage. Uh, the first one are what we're going to call the low volume metastatic disease. Should we, instead of giving docetaxel or abirateron, apply local treatment or treatment to the metastatic deposit. And uh, when they have a rising PSA, you do a PET PSMA, you see a single lymph node, two lymph nodes, should you irradiate them? Should you remove them? Because that's really the question. And you repeat the same question in the M0 CRPC setting. So that's basically three settings we have identified in which we can have the discussion we're going to have right now. Uh, the first question somebody may ask is, is that something frequent? So we look at that, and we look actually at uh, 100 patients that were transiting from the M0 to the M plus setting using uh, whole body MRI. And we say, OK, if we use that modern imaging technology, how many of the patients actually would be candidate, uh, would be declared oligometastatic? And uh, surprisingly, it's a lot. It's between 25 and 30 percent of the patient. So uh, that's something that has changed in the last few years. We have a lot of patients who suddenly will develop metastases, and when develop metastases, it's one on two. But the scientists would say, and when I show this data to Chris Logotitis in the US, he say, okay, actually, just that paper 
is again metastatic targeted therapy. Because what he's telling you is that the vast majority of the patient, when they transit from M0 to M+, plus, they develop multiple metastases. And we usually don't think about these patients. But you can take the bottle, half empty, half full, and say globally 25%. The second observation is that when they develop metastases, it is outside the traditional landing site. When we had patients with, with radical prostatectomy, rising PSA, we would send the patient to the radiation oncologist, and they more or less agree on irradiating the prostatic bed and the lymph nodes, using a standard definition of the lymph node, which is more or less pelvic. And when you do this study, whether it's PET coline, PET PSMA, or whole body MRI, what you realize is that actually most of the lymph nodes that are appearing in this first metastatic setting are appearing outside these boundaries. And you can have sometimes patients with cervical positive lymph node. So that's also an important message because it says that maybe the traditional way we have ad uh, administered salvage therapy is not good either. So we have to rethink about the whole strategy. It is not only about metastatic targeted therapy, it is also about maybe thinking, should we still do blinded salvage treatment? So when you speak about that thing, so basically treating metastatic deposit by surgery radiotherapy, there is something wonderful, and that's typical in urology, is that actually everybody considered that acceptable. Oh yeah, we should do, why not? It's good. It has certainly a benefit on the patient. And it has been absolutely accepted everywhere. Which read to that uh, paper, which unfortunately now is one of my most cited papers, which has actually about chasing Pokemons. You know Pokemons. If you don't know, usually your children know. So it's that game when you, know, you walk in Zurich, and every time you see a small guy, you hit it. And when we wrote that paper with Chris Sweeney and Declan Murphy, uh, it was in Australia where they do a lot of PET PSMA, they irradiate everybody. We say, okay, without any robust evidence, we have embarked in that game. And now if you discuss MDT across the planet, if you follow a guy, post prostatectomy, PET PSMA, two lymph nodes, boom, we do radiotherapy or we remove it. It has become accepted everywhere. But keep in mind, there is a major difference between what is acceptable and what is true. Acceptability doesn't relate to the level of evidence. It relates to the level of conventional wisdom. Is it acceptable to do it? And what we're going to try now is try to see what are the pitfalls to move that field from acceptability to evidence. Because that's not easy, and it's going to take time. The first pitfall is we have an imaging conundrum. We have an imaging problem, and we need to improve it. Because indeed, we know that conventional imaging technology, which is guideline approved, very poor diagnostic performance by bone and soft tissue, we, we shouldn't use that for metastatic targeted therapy. Because there is always more than what you see on this technology. We had a beautiful lecture on PET-PSMA. I'm not going to repeat more about PET-PSMA. We had put coline, we have all body MRI, we call this NIT, new imaging technology, versus SIT, conventional imaging technology. And you can see better and more with NIT, and that has been proven many, many times. This would be a typical situation where you would do the wrong thing using conventional imaging, and you're not sure you would do the good thing if you knew the, the use the new imaging technology. That's a rising PSA post prostatectomy. You see the PSA kinetic. At some point, it's got a bone scan. It's got a single bone metastatic deposit. And you decide to irradiate. That would be a very bad thing, because actually, if you use all bone, all body MRI, the metastatic deposit was there already three months before. And by the time you see it on the bone scan, you have multiple bone metastases, and you're going to treat that one and leave the other one alone. So if you believe in metastatic targeted therapy, one of the first pitfalls, it has to be on new imaging technology. But then come the question, and it was addressed already, is it good enough? 
is PET PSMA, all body MRI, and PET choline good enough to embark into that strategy? And I've got doubt. The first one, they don't see the same metastatic deposit. That's a patient with patient follow blindly. He had the PET PSMA and the whole body MRI in two institutions, distant five kilometers apart. They say you've got lymph node on the PET PSMA and you've got bone metastasis with the whole body MRI, too. The whole body MRI doesn't see the lymph node, the PET PSMA doesn't see the bone metastasis. We did biopsy, they both cancer. So you have no test at all, which is exhaustive enough. And then the problem is that they see more and they don't see everything. And there are two beautiful papers to illustrate that. That paper is my favorite one. It's by Francesco Montorsi. It's called Robot Assisted Salvage Lymph Node Dissection for Clinically Recurrent Prostate Cancer. So basically, it is an ode to the robot. And they say, yes, you can do lymph node dissection with robotic surgery when you are good. But then it was looking at the result. They did 16 patients, 3 coline, 13 PSMA. And then look at patient with positive lymph node at uh, lymph node dissection. 68%. So in 32% of the patient, it was false positive. What was removed didn't contain cancer. And then you look at biochemical response after lymph node dissection, because you say, okay, if you remove everything, PSA should drop to less than 0.2. They had a prostatectomy before. 30% of the patient. So conclusion, not everything you see is cancer, and there is always more than what you see. Second paper, exactly the same, coming from Germany, very nice paper, PET coline, PET PSMA, patient with positive lymph node, 20, 81, 87, 13 person, 20 person false positive, biochemical response after dissection, 21, 45, 7 person. So conclusion, yes, as it has been proven now, PET PSMA is probably much better than choline, but still, it's not good enough. Radiotherapy series. Everybody now will cite that paper by Pete Ost as, yes, no, we have a randomized control trial showing that MDT works, but actually, if you look at MDT, PSA response rate, no response at all to radiotherapy. Two hypotheses. Prostate cancer is radioresistant. That would be revisiting 100 years of history. Prostate cancer is radiosensitive. Or there is something else than what has been irradiated. And of note, there are patients with a PSA response who have been irradiate, not irradiated as well. So clearly, in PIT study, they are false positive as well. We need to solve that. Unless we accept that we treat 20% of the patient for nothing, but that's a problem because we are treating low burden disease. Second, we have to define the exponent. What, what do you expect? That's always the question I ask when my residents say, oh, we did a PET PSMA, it's got a positive lymph node, we should remove it. And I also I always ask why? Because if it's just to remove it, yes, you, you can remove it. I know that. But why? Why do you expect? And that's still, we still have to define what are the art endpoints. Because so far, we have used soft endpoint, like tied to systemic treatment. And I'm sorry, but delaying systemic treatment is not a valid endpoint. And I'm going to show you two cases. The first one, typical patient, high risk prostate cancer, is scheduled for prostatectomy, he's got an old body MRI, you see a metastatic deposit here. We did a biopsy, it is prostate cancer. So now what do you do? Uh, do you do radical prostatectomy plus MDT? Do you follow the guidelines and you say it's metastatic, I will give docetaxel? We have to take decision because the problem at di this point in time is that we have either to acknowledge that what you see is metastatic deposit or you have to ignore it. And it comes to the question is that really that single bone metastasis, is it really a poor prognostic indicator? Does it change the trajectory of the patient? And that, to be honest, we don't know. We are testing that. I'm going to show you a study by Martin Spahn, but we, 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 we will test that. Well, we don't have the response, and that response is crucial. Because indeed, if it's not such a progno bad prognostic marker, then 
the study we have to do is local treatment, fixed duration of ADT plus minus metastatic directed therapy. If indeed that is really a poor prognosis, we have to switch. And maybe the reference treatment is ADT. And then we have to decide which one of these treatments we're going to add to that patient. But where the problem is the most crucial right now is in the rising PSA. That's where you see most of the activity. That's why where you see most of stereotaxic radiation therapy and salvage lymph node dissection. So I took a case, typical case. He had radical prostatectomy. It's a T3A and 0M0, extended lymph node dissection. It's a PT3B Gleason 8. He's got a rise in PSA. He's got conventional salvage radiation therapy, so not modern image guided, uh, prostatic bed plus lymph node, and then it's got a rapid recurrence. And that's where we see most of the activity. That's where Professor Ackerborn has show wonderful picture with PET PSMA. So I'm going to show you some with whole body MRI as well. So negative bone scan, negative CT scan. You say that patient is a simple uh, rise in PSA. But no, he's got one metastatic deposit that you can clearly see here. You can see it on the whole body diffusion technique, and you can see it here. So now, what, what, what do you want to do? Uh, what, what do you expect from MDT? And I think here, we have gone a slightly wrong way. Because the way we've been is to say, we're going to use that to delay the entrance of systemic treatment. It is smart, because if you want to do a trial, that is the best way to get your result rapidly. But if you want to help the patient, that's not necessarily the good way. This is Pete's beautiful trial, because they did it. It is one of the only randomized trials on the topic, so they should be applauded. But the primary endpoint is delaying ADT. First of all, you say that, indeed, you delay ADT if you keep that guy on surveillance be, uh, versus you irradiate the metastasis, but it's not for a long time. And then you can ask yourself, but is it acceptable to do that? Because yes, we can do it, but does it help the patient? And that's where we have a problem. Because indeed, the rising PSA patient is really made of two cohorts with absolutely different cancer tra uh, trajectory. You have the low PSA kinetic and the high PSA kinetic. And it's been shown over and over and over again that the low PSA kinetic has a worse trajectory, where patients with low PSA kinetic, you know, low PSA doubling time, they usually live forever. And it has been shown also for hormone therapy. If overall there is no benefit of immediate androgen deprivation therapy, that affirmation doesn't stand true for patients with a rapid PSA doubling time. And already in retrospective series, it's been shown that if you have a high PSA and a low PSA doubling time, you may eventually benefit from early hormone therapy versus late hormone therapy. And in that patient by Garcia Albenis, it's interesting to see that he considered as early administration of hormone therapy, hormone therapy given for a PSA doubling time less than 12 months. So based on retrospective theory, there is a consensus that patients with a rapid PSA doubling time indeed benefit from immediate hormone therapy. And using as an endpoint that is delaying hormone therapy may in the end be detrimental to the patient. And we even have a randomized control trial, a small one, but a good one that was done in Australia by the Tasmanian Radiation Oncology Group that randomized 261 patients and showed that actually immediate ADT improve overall survival. And that's my problem when you use an endpoint like this. When you say, OK, it is acceptable to irradiate the patient because you save toxicity of hormone therapy, you delay hormone therapy, yeah, but maybe you're going to shorten your patient overall survival. The standard of care off. And I have a worry with speed paper when you see that 30% have a PSA doubling time less than three months at inclusion. And as a corollary of that, it's interesting to see that if you look at the rate of progression to polymetastatic status, there is not much of a difference. So clearly, uh, it is important to do it like this, OK? 
Finally, three quick points. There is toxicity to MDT. It has been shown for radiotherapy, and it has been shown as well for surgery. This is a patient we treated, rising PSA, all body MRI. You see here metastatic deposit. Usually we wait a little bit to confirm that the patient is not progressing to polymetastatic disease, uh, which was the case, so we decided to remove the lymph node. PSA dropped very well, very interesting. Then you see here a huge collection. Actually, it has poisoned the life of the patient for six months. It's a huge lymphocyl. And if you look at the literature, even in the best hand, you have quite some complication, up to 33% of Clavien grade 3 complication. Second quick point, we have no idea how to measure the, the response. Is PSA a good response? Is imaging a good response? I want to show you something interesting. So that's patient with negative bone scan. So that's basically the patient I show you uh, a few minutes ago. So we did stereotaxic radiation therapy on the bone mats. You see that it, the signal is disappearing on the diffusion. It is reconolalized by uh, fatty tissue here. And if you follow that patient on bone scan, you would say, oh, my patient is progressing right now. No, actually, he's healing, is building new bone. And so once you're using new technology, you can't switch to the old one because they give you a mixed message. And then to finish that presentation, my most important limitation to that problem is that we don't understand the biology of oligometastatic disease. And actually, keep in mind that imaging, it's like a picture. It's something which is frozen in time for a few milliseconds. That is a bullet crossing a bottle of beer. You never see that in real life. It is a snapshot. So if this is a stable condition, indeed, you may have a chance to cure your patient. But if it is not a stable condition, if it is a transit condition to a more rapidly progression, you, you're not going to do anything. And the science would tell you that in most patients, it's a transit state towards a diffusion of the disease. And this is an example of a patient on the Garelix. He was actually treated only with TURP and hormone therapy. After one year, he's got a rise in PSA. He's got only three metastatic deposits. That patient was not well managed to start with. So we decided to do radiotherapy on the bone deposit and on the prostate. And you see that after one and a half year, the PSA is very low and that the metastatic have disappeared. But these patients are quite rare. This is another patient. I show you the patient already. Single bone metastatic deposit here. We decide rapid PSA doubling time. We decided not to give hormone therapy, just to give metastatic targeted therapy, stereotaxic. You see after three months, that is the patient I show you earlier. He's got massive diffusion. Another one, single bone metastatic diffusion here. We do stereotaxic radiation therapy. You remember the patient before? The signal had disappeared. No, the diffusion signal sig persists, although the PSA is going down. Three months after, it's got multiple metastatic disease. So you would argue that delaying systemic treatment was not a good idea. So we need to sort that out. How are we going to do that? We have trial. This is Oligocare. This is a very large estro EORTC initiative that is targeted to lung, breast, prostate, GI, melanoma. The idea is to register 2,000 patients or more to try to get information on these patients and, more important, collect material to understand the biology. <coughs> Martin Spahn will do the same with patients surgically treated. This is a very complicated uh, scheme, but the idea is to collect information on modern imaging assessment to see whether it's a predictive factor or no, and get tissue to understand the biology. And finally, uh, Movember is <coughs> organizing the GAP6 this year. They're going to do the same on oligometastatic. So in conclusion, uh, yes, it's sexy. Yes, it's interesting. Yes, we all do it. But there is a risk. It's a bandwagon effect. That basically we just do it because everybody's doing it. So we have to be careful. I don't say we shouldn't do it. But every time we do it, we should keep in mind the few pitfalls and try to correct them as much as we can. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and all the ideas about whether we are doing the right thing or not. Are there any questions from the audience? <coughs> Uh, you mentioned two papers uh, describing quite high uh, false positive rates. Um, do you know whether these uh, um, analyses also included uh, PET analysis after surgery? That's a problem, as you know. Overall, except in a few uh, in a few centers, we have very little information on the quality assurance. Bef uh, uh, around imaging, and actually, that's a problem. Is that the performance of the PSMA itself may be deteriorated when it's used. And one of the objectives of the platform and the ESTRO EORTC collaboration, and also an um, initiative like ENAM uh, next week, is really to at least harmonize the way PET are read it, interpreted, and to collect proper post surgery. Because indeed, these are false positive on this paper, but we don't know whether they are real false positive. So that's a very important message. The only thing we know, and I was with, uh, we had this information from Caroline Goffin in uh, Leuven, is that the people who've done PET, uh, all body MRI PET PSMA, and we don't like to, to we, we like to speak about discordance. So we, we have not done 100 patient PET PSMA all body MRI. We have around 20% discordance. Who is right? Who is wrong? We don't know. The recommendation we make to the clinician is that a nice way to answer to the two pitfall, is it a stable condition? And is it a false positive or not? Is to repeat the exam after a certain period of time before you embark on MTD. But it's going to take time to harmonize and answer this question about what is the real diagnostic accuracy of these uh, techniques. Maybe just a question to Professor Habercorn. What is the impact on, on the time of the administration of the PSMA ligand with, uh, with regard to the time of production? So the, the, the half lifetime was 68 minutes, I, if I remember correctly. And when is the best moment to inject the tracer? So is there any, deep, how long can you wait until, uh, until, uh, w until to, to, to get the best result for the patient? If you wait 70 minutes, is it far, uh, is it a, a much less good? examination than if you wait only 15 minutes? Uh, do, we, do we have any idea on the biology of these false positive? Because this is something we are extremely interested in as well. We, we're studying now the false negative. So we did PSMA staining on the false positive, and very interestingly, a high proportion do express PSMA on the self surface. So it's very, very, very interesting. Okay, then that's, that's the, the problem is the definition of false. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, Ligand specific. Ligand specific. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. And the target is, it would be nice if we had an all or nothing in the tumor, but there is no specific target for any tumor. No, exactly. That's a problem for every diagnosis. Probably a short comment. As far as I remember, the group of Montorsi, they uh, did the salvage lymphadenectomy in many cases uh, that already had lymphadenectomy performed during. Uh, the initial surgery, and I, my impression is that these cases are much harder to operate, and it's much more difficult to find the positive node, especially if it's presacral or if it's in the internal region. So I, what you say that probably the PSMA was positive, the lymph node was negative. The question is, did they? 
find the lymph node. I think yeah, this is an important that's point. That's the other aspect of the quality assurance is the surge quality assurance. And to my knowledge, the only one who have embarked on this is GI surgeon on oligometastatic deposit in the liver where they look carefully at the value of the imaging and the value of the surgery. And people would be extremely surprised that indeed you need both to be sure of what you're doing. Um, thanks for the excellent talk and also thanks for the critical comments on, on Pete Oss trial. I have a question on how do you interpret the results. If you look at the freedom from systemic treatment, it appears that at the first couple of months there's not much yeah. difference between metastasis directed treatment or not. So there's a relevant proportion of patients who will progress rapidly, what you have also shown. But if you move to the right to a longer follow-up, it appears that um, without the metastatic directed treatment it just goes down to 0% and there might be a tail at about 40%. Do you think this tail at 30-40% is real, which would say actually 40% of the patients might have a long-term benefit? Or is it just that you would say, well, patient numbers are still small enough to have a valid conclusion on that question? Uh, <coughs> I, would, I think I would put that in the perspective of the bullet pictures, that indeed among these patients, they are patients with stable disease, stable condition. And it is interesting that we see these patients mostly in patients who have been improperly diagnosed or treated to start with. Like if you look at the pattern of recurrence on PET-PSMA, according to the patient had or not an extended lymph node dissection, indeed, you see different landing sites. So I think that in Pete's trial, indeed, there is a proportion, 40% is probably absolutely immature, but it's enough to say there is a proportion that can be cured by uh, that treatment alone. So that is clear. No, in the future, we're going to have to refine who are they. We're going to have to refine what is the best protocol to treat them. Because I told Pete, you know, uh, yes, maybe the metastases, they have a different biology, but you can't go around 45 years of radiotherapy that said that in the prostate, every time you irradiate, if you give a little bit of hormone, it is better. So it is compelling evidence, but clearly, these are extremely good phase two trials showing that indeed, lymph node and bone metastases, if they are bone metastases, is made of a population that has patients that will be cured with that alone. So that's really, really promising. And it is possible that it's not going to be 40%, but that's going to be the case. You know it's the same with ADT. If you put somebody on ADT, everybody say they all progress to... Uh, they all progress to castration resistant. It's, it's not true. 20% live forever. Uh, it's rare, but it, it happened as well. Excellent talk, Bertrand. Um, Girish Kulkarni, University of Toronto. Uh, which endpoint should we, should we be using then? You have oligocare. Do we have a surrogate endpoint that you would use, or should we simply use OS, DSS? And if it is a surrogate endpoint, what will it be? Mets free survival and with which imaging modality then? We're discussing a lot, as you know, with Chris Sweeney and the ISCAP group to see whether the observation we have made in the high risk localized disease could be translated into that setting as well and use MFS with conventional technology as a surrogate endpoint. Uh, the problem is we don't have the data. And uh, at this point in time, we did a try with EMA. We went, we EORT, we have an EORT EMA party. We spoke with these guys, and although they recognize MFS in non-metastatic deposit, they would say what I mentioned is that unless we demonstrate that this new imaging technology is a biomarker for an aggressive disease, they won't really accept. So the, the shortest we can do would be MFS with conventional uh, technology, except if in the meantime, the imaging community demonstrate that PET-PSMA, MRI, whole body MRI or pet coline progression is indeed a surrogate. That would help us. So we're really hoping from the imaging field that this trial would become, if tomorrow, Heidelberg show that if you go from PET PSMA A plus B with an X person increase, that's a surrogate for death, then that's going to be another option. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful discussion and a wonderful talk. Thank you very much again. So, uh, ich übergebe die Moderation an Peter Dr. Thomas Hermanns.